people here have had Lyme or something like Lyme? Wow. Or pets, yeah. They had pets on there. But it's really interesting because a lot of times, like three quarters of the room is like, hey, we've had Lyme disease, right? And so, you know, many of us have been affected by it. And if you haven't personally, somebody, you know, probably in your neighborhood or in your business complex has. Um, and it has been changing. So it's really important to start to understand these things. A lot of what we're presenting here, um, we understand that if this is the first time or you've had a basic understanding, but now you're getting like sort of this more advanced sort of look at it, it's going to sort of be a bit overwhelming. But, you know, you have the slides. And I remember starting this way back. And I, heard, I was taught in medical school, this is the way it is. And then I found out I had Lyme of babesiosis. And somebody said, no, you actually do it this way. And I went to my first Lyme conference. And I don't think I've recovered yet. And that was like, you know, in 2004. And it's just, it's, it can be a bit daunting and overwhelming. Um, and someone had mentioned I look kind of comfortable and casual about talking about all this, but this is literally all I've done every day for the last 10 years, right? So then we were having this conversation up here, and a few people, we were talking about Lyme, and I was feeling really comfortable. And then two of you guys started talking and, you're, and you know, started going off on the eyeball, and I'm like, man, I sort of remember that, right? But I couldn't have like this super high-end conversation uh, about the visual processing to the same depth as you guys do, because that's what you do all day long. And so while I have a basic understanding of a lot of this, and thanks to my friends, I know more, that, that is part of the reality is I can't know everything, and that's why I surround myself with really smart people. And so I highly recommend you do the same. Um, and I just happen to be surrounded by a bunch of people who are smarter than me, so I look like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about, and the other thing is, you know, with these co-infections, these are things that we see around. And I've chosen um, a couple of the really big hitters, particularly three of the four main deer tick pathogens to talk about, because they're the ones that we commonly see presenting with symptoms that you're going to see in your practices. And, that we, and particularly being a father, uh, you know, I, I, these are things that we see in children. And so it's like, I want my daughter to have a great life and be able to you know, be healthy. And I want everybody else's kid to be the same way because my litmus test for treating patients is they should expect to get the same treatment I would give to my wife, my daughter, myself, or my family members. So I go home and I sleep really well and they, know get, they get the very best that I have even, you know, even if it's not all that good that one day. But we really have to be, in my mind, looking out for the children. You know, they're our future. And it, so Bartonella, there's a ton of Bartonella species out there. And the thing with Bartonella is they like to hide inside of cells. And so one of the cells, so there's a bunch of them listed here, which is really interesting to me, is this is an immune system cell, the macrophages. And microglia are sort of support structures in the brain, but these are things that actually act as if they were immune cells in the brain if the brain is infected, because we don't want to have an immune system directly in the brain. But the problem is Bartonella likes to go into these cells. So what we're finding is a lot of people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and early cognitive changes actually have a lot of reactivated or activation of microglia. And a lot of our therapies that are helping adjunctively in Lyme disease and other co-infections are targeting decreasing the inflammation of these cells. But it's really kind of interesting though, you know, we're trying to, um, microglia are also interesting because one of the ways that I go about getting to these is to use um, uh, antioxidant nasal sprays, different combinations of things that go up along the nasal lymphatics because the glymphatic system that detoxifies the brain drains primarily something like 70% of the cerebrospinal fluid, the dirty water part, if you will, actually drains through the nasal lymphatics and through the neck, right? So I'm sure a lot of you guys see people who are head forward like this, and then you start to put them in better posture. As their postural tone gets better, their brain detoxifies better. And then maybe we can turn off some of this reactivation of these microglia, and then, and then the other people on our team are going to be knocking out the Bartonella better because you've gotten somebody to have a better posture, and we've taken advantage of anatomy and physiology and not just treating a bug. And that's just one quick example of how that multidisciplinary team can work. So Bartonella can be transmitted by fleas and um, t uh, lice. Uh, it's really commonly, I, I find people have been exposed um, through having lice at school. Um, it is possible to get them from ticks. It's sort of, we see it a lot as we showed earlier in the ticks. There's not 100% confirmation that they do transmit it. It certainly looks like that. 
And there's also evidence in the literature that Bartonella may be passed by house spiders as well. So things to think about. And also um, vets and animal control tend to get it through animal bites and scratches. And again, Bartonella is another one that we can get through blood transfusion. As I said, it's an intracellular pathogen, so basically it hides. And Lyme and uh, Bartonella are well known to go to antibiotic privileged places and immune system privileged places in your body, basically meaning they hide and your body can't get to it and our drugs can't get to it. There are three main species that I usually talk about, and Bartonella hensley is the causative agent of cat scratch fever, so that's one of sort of the more common ones that we've all learned about. Um, I commonly see positive serology here. Uh, Bartonella quintana can cause trench fever. I do see positive serologies here, but these two can cross-react when you're doing testing. Um, and then there's another one, um, a subspe another species is called Vinsoni burkhoffi that's come out because we find it in dogs, but they're starting to see cases of human infection. Um, unfortunately, there's no real good test for this except if you're in a research setting, but it does cause a lot of the same other symptoms. <laughs>